So I'm going to move on next to the capacitors. So that's the same order as in the manual. We have a number of ceramic disc capacitors and we have four electrolytics. I've got all of the 0.1 microfarad despiking caps here uh, in a separate bag. They were separated in the little kit I bought. We have the four electrolytics, which are obvious from size. Uh, these are Illinois capacitor. They're actually 33 microfarad, I believe. Get them where I can read them here. 50 volt. I need to change glasses. Uh, I'm going with these for a couple of reasons. Yeah, they're 33 microfarad. It says 35 up here. In this case, 33 will be fine. 33 is a standard value. Now, they're, like I said, Illinois capacitors. Uh, 50 volt. You know, they're 85 degree caps, but it's Illinois capacitors. These are going to be quality capacitors. Uh, I'm going to go with the 50 volters just because they're physically a little larger. So they're a little closer to the size the original caps would have been. As capacitor technologies improve, electrolytics have gotten smaller and smaller with the same capacitance and voltage rating. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use these. Uh, they'll look fine on here. We've got... Why do we only see three ceramic discs here? Where's the fourth? Uh, there it is. So I'm going to start out with the oddball values. So there should be... Sort these and figure out which one is which. So this one's just got the number 10 on it. That's going to be the 10 picofarad. This one's got 20J on it. It's most likely the 20 picofarad. White doesn't help much, but that's labeled 20J. I'm guessing that's the 20 picofarad. the 100 picofarad and this is the 0.01 so there's really four of them here they're different values I'm going to put these in first so I don't confuse them with the 0.1 microfarad caps so again this is the 0.01 it is at C3 get down now into the picture and find the Location of C3. Uh, or in this case, S, well, C3, SC3, there's C1. Let's see if we can spot it here. C6, C4, C5, C3. So 3C is sitting here. And that's a good fit. The 10 picofarad is C4, and that is right. That's a little hard to make out. Uh, so there's two sets of holes here that are both C4. That's interesting. I guess they wanted to be able to put maybe multiple values in. Uh, the pads are connected together on both sides, so I guess I could go into either set of holes. We have the 20, it's, it's marked 20J, this is going to be the 20 picofarad at C6. Let's see if I can spot it, C6 is right here. And I'm just being me, I'm putting all the capacitors in with the markings facing the same direction. So he's not quite as nice a fit. I'd like it in fairly straight if at all possible. And then we end up with the part that is marked. It's really hard to read. 100K. And that's going to be the uh, 100 picofarad here at location C5. C4, C6, C3. Let's see if we can spot C5 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are all going to be 0.1 microfarad. These spiking caps, I'm sure, along here. C1. Again, looking for C5. C10, 9, 7, 8. C6, 
C4, C5. Okay, C5 is the same way where there's a double set of uh, holes in the board and they're hooked together. So he's really going to end up right there. Let me flex the leads out a bit to kind of hold him in place. Those are all going to sit there. So we can solder those four in. So that's really all of those. Uh, there's the picture. So we've picked up C3, C4, C5, C6. And that marks off these locations. There's C3, C4, C5, and C6 are all in. Four electrolytics. Everybody else here then is going to be the out of this little bag of 0.1 microfarad. And there's quite a number of these. And the one issue I'm going to have with these is lead spacing. These are, should either be marked 104, and they are, so they're 0.1. The lead spacing is going to be an issue here. Getting these in so that I'm actually happy with how they're installed. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of work and I haven't decided quite yet how I'm going to do that. And the lead spacings down here vary. So I don't know if I'm going to go to the trouble of forming all the leads to kind of get these to look something I'm happy with. This is always kind of a pain to do. Whether it's worth all this work, and that's really not going to probably be wide enough. Well, it's not too bad. That's C2, and that's definitely one of them. Getting these where they don't look sloppy is going to be some work. So that's C2. I don't honestly think I can just push these in, but maybe I can and just kind of work them in where I'm somewhat happy with them. C2. So one, two, and three, or one and two. Oh, what did I do here? That's interesting. So there's a C3. So three C3 is up here someplace. C3 is right there. And there's also an SC3 on the board. Which is kind of confusing. That's really confusing. SC1 through 20, okay. This is taking a little bit to figure out here. SC1 through 20 are point ones. So they really are. So this SC3 here is in that range of uh, point ones. So we're okay. That's kind of a fail in the silkscreen marking. And again, that's not. Uh, the fall of the gentleman who came up with the reproduction PCBs, he followed their original silkscreen markings. That's just kind of weird. Get those 
all kind of in line together. That doesn't look too bad. It's interesting, all of those are tied together to create a 0.3 microfarad cap. Don't know why they decided they needed extra capacitance there. But they did. Those all look reasonably straight. I'm not unhappy with that. Heights are slightly different, but that is going to be reality for these. Not uncommon for the lead spacing on the caps and older hardware like this to be different than what's on the PCB. So, really now it's going to become just identifying the locations, working my way through all of these, uh, and getting that done. So that's SC1, SC2, SC3. And again, I'm not going to stuff all these capacitors in real time and bore you. So uh, when I get them all in, uh, we'll come back to real time video and finish up with the electrolytics. So we'll finish up uh, the capacitors with the electrolytics. Looks like get this rotated so that the markings are up. Hopefully, that'll give me a pretty good lead spacing. And it does. Paying attention to polarity, these electrolytics are polarized. These ceramic discs, of course, aren't. I prefer having the actual markings for the capacitance, etc., up. Uh, it makes it a little easier to service. Again, paying attention here to the, in this case, the little ring here is for, towards the positive and it's got arrows pointing towards the negative and the board is silk screen, positive and negative. So I'm going to trust the silk screen. Smart or unsmart, I'm going to trust it. Let's tack these in on one side. Take a look at alignment. somewhat in line with each other. Again, just it's a neatness thing. The reality is this board's going to get handled and parts are going to get moved around with fingertips and that kind of stuff, but that is what it is. So those are two of them, and I'm guessing these are on the minus five 
and plus 12 rails. We've got the zeners to control those voltages there. Um, we've got two more over here that I'm going to as you know, assume are on the plus 8. Uh, get this rotated the way I want it. Get them polarized. Now, one of them actually sits up on top of oh, lead spacing was a little wider on these. One of them actually sits up on top of that jumper, and the other one doesn't. Which is kind of sad, and, and at the end of it, a little bit different heights on the PCB. Such as life, although I can do this, try to stuff a piece of wire under there. And they're both going to be up slightly off the board because of that, but I can try to make them both about the same height. Again, totally unnecessary. But it's what I'm going to choose to do. They're not perfect, they never will be, but they're reasonable. happy with any of these. I'm going to retouch them all up, add a little more solder. These are both really dull. I'd like the final joint to end up nice and bright. Dull is an indication of a cold solder joint. I believe that finishes off the capacitors. C9, 10, 11, 12, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So there we are. It's actually starting to look pretty nice. Uh, we're really getting down to, I think, crystals and diodes, and that's about it. We might as well just wrap those up in this same video. Take a look in the manual. Jumpers are in. We have the crystal, the two diodes, the transistor, voltage regulator, and the header. So now let's just wrap this all up in the same video. It's not that much more to get put in. So let's start with the two zeners. They're in a bag over here. Actually, so far I haven't spotted the footprint for the transistor, which is kind of interesting. I might as well pull the crystal out of here as well. Again, not being able to find an old school crystal like this in the very large package was disappointing, you know, at 2 megahertz. I found others online around the value. I found 2 megahertz in the, in the newer modern, much smaller size. But ultimately, so this is the 12 volt. It goes at D1. Let's see if I can get an idea of the spacing there. Certainly not him. 0 0.4, 0 0.5 again, so 
on the leads. Cut that tag off. This is the 12 volt. 12 volt is D1. D1 is right here. Get that to flex down in there. And then we have D2. These Zener diodes are polarized components. They have a black band marking on the package. And in the silk screen, there's a little white line over here on the right hand side that correlates with the black band printed on the, the Zener. So get him down in there. Get those captive. They look good enough. They're not perfectly aligned to each other, but that's okay. Tack one leg on each. Take a final look. Black bands are both correct. So this gives us the local voltage regulation. The 8080 processor requires minus 12 and minus 5 along with plus 5, if I remember. Definitely requires plus 5, but I think it's minus 12 and minus 5 to actually operate. And that's what these provide. So we've got the two Zeners in. They are in here on D1 and D2. Pull the transistor out, it's floating around here. Gotta find it. There's the footprint for it over here. So, I can't assume the pinout for it. So, this is a perfect time to pull out the uh, Peak Atlas DCA Pro. And let it tell me what the pin out of the device is. It's labeled on the silk screen, of course, emitter base collector. And this should give me the pin out based on the, the color of the leads. So let's go ahead and test. And it comes back with an NPN silicone. Uh, transistor, red is the collector, green is of course the base, and blue is the emitter. So it looks like it's going to go with a flat facing over here to the right hand side. Run that one more time. Yeah, red is the collector. Red, so the red lead on the tester goes to the collector. Center lead is almost always base, and the blue lead goes to the emitter, so he really does go in kind of that orientation. I would have actually put him in backwards if I had just eyeballed this, which is uh, interesting. Let's see if we can get him down in there and reasonably straight. has turned itself off. I actually had to run downstairs to pick the tester up. So it should have been laying up here on the bench, but it got used downstairs. So one leads in a square. Sure seems like it's facing the wrong way, but that's just based on typically the, the, the pad orientation here. At least in the stuff I've experienced, has a device facing the other way, but that's just maybe a fluke of the PCB layout. See, it looks like it is a fluke of the PCB layout, but that's really good enough. He's in. We've got the crystal, which comes next. It looks like I'm just going to want to bend the leads about one width of the end of the needle nose here, out from the package, 
Great, I didn't get that square or straight. of going in square. It does. This came pre-installed with the little piece of 3M tape on the back. That looks square to me. I'm happy with that. Looks good enough. Two megahertz marking up. You'll know, probably announce this is a two megahertz eighty eighty machine. We're getting really close here for so the crystals in. The transistor was down here. The crystals, of course, up here. Dads are both in. See, the thing in the instructions is this was a different package. It had a flat on the emitter. And, you know, it's a completely different package from this. So that's part of why I had to test it is uh, what it said to do in here and what reality were are two different things. So really, I think we're down to redoing the voltage regulator. heat sink and the 8-pin uh, I.O. connector thing for the front panel and then we'll be kind of ready to move ahead to testing the actual power supply so he's got a lock washer on that I've done this double heat sink thing myself in the past use some heat sink compound. Let's just see how this is going to line up. Yeah, how that's going to work okay. So it's going to come at it with the screw up through the bottom. And we're going to have the same issue we had before with lead length. screw's going to fall out here. Hopefully I'm getting those somewhat where they need to be. See, we'll restack that. issues again with the uh, center lead not really reaching down and having to kind of bend the lead down but that's okay See if I have any chance now here of getting it all to line up Too bad. The little nut has a built in lock washer, which is nice. I could conceivably put some heat sink compound behind this. And honestly, probably should. Need the, uh, get that just snugged up. Two of the leads peeking through. We'll bend the third one until that lead peeks through.
course the ground there is taking some heat to do. So I'm going to touch these up from the top since they look rather cold up here. solder float through to the back of the board and I'm going to add a little more solder on that center pin and that doesn't look too bad eight sinks are square you can put a little more tension on it is that all of our components Just to use heat sink grease, I will uh, add that off camera. Uh, there's no reason to record that. So really, I think we have this board. I keep saying that, and I'm wrong. I was gonna say almost fully stuffed. Uh, orientation. I'm gonna want it that direction becomes that way. See, so yeah, that'll work. Not the prettiest. So let's just get it held in place. Get one pin tacked. Make sure it's square and then finish soldering it up. solder joint is really horrid. I'm not sure why. That's a little better. Touch up the ends down here. Oh, that pin's actually sitting at a different height. Doggone it. That's why the solder joint doesn't look the same. Yeah. Get something I can sit up under there and reflow that and push down so that the pins will all end up at the same height. That pin actually slid down in the connector. So let me push down here. That gets it flush across the front. They're not perfect solder joints, they're not horrible. So this is what this is going to look like coming into the back plane as we have, like I said, the front panel interface card here. The CPU card is going to sit, well, if I can not drop it, in the first slot. And then this cable is going to wrap around to here. And again, this is on the original card. Uh, you actually brought wires off there to the original front panel and he's interconnected this way instead which is perfect then the ribbon cable comes out of here to the front panel that's really the way it'll be in the assembly those wires may need to be uh, managed a little bit really the next step and we'll pick this up in the next video is check power supply rails on here before we put any uh, actual semiconductors in especially the processor and the clock generator clock generator interrupt controller boy now I've confused I don't remember uh, clock generator is not 24 pin I've been calling this the wrong part this whole time I think but such is life but really in the, in a, in the next video we'll uh, check some gross power supply rails and the regulated rails and see where we end up so I'll see you in that video